The gentleman that I'm fixing to introduce to the pulpit in a minute, Brother Qatar, who used to pastor in Columbus, Ohio, has now been hired by the Home Missions Department nationwide. He is traveling district after district, trying to make us aware to reach the Filipino people. He's, and he, is, he has done a great job so far going different places. And now look, and next Sunday, his boss will be here. I am bringing in Brother Tony. Brother Tony is the home mission director for the entire United Pentecostal Church. Now, some of you, you didn't even say amen. Brother Tony, I showed you his DVD about two weeks after this because of the times. He preached the conference message at Because of the Times. And we showed it. You, you probably slept since then. You don't remember. But it was a blockbuster. And I've got him coming in for next Sunday morning and Sunday night. So you're going to be greatly blessed. And uh, everything's going to be wonderful. Trust me. Amen. I told Brother Qatar, I said, now, Brother Qatar, I've never done this in all the years I've been the pastor of this church, but I did it to you. I want you to understand. I, I called the foreign missions director of the state who asked me to have you. And I said, now, look, this is a preacher's church. I don't need nobody after what I just went through that can't preach. And I said, I don't mind the program, fine. But if he can't preach, just let me know because I will preach and I will give him an offering. And they turned around and said, they turned around and told me he can preach. And he will preach. Why don't you make him welcome, brother and sister Qatar? Just do that one more time to Jesus Christ, shall we? Praise the name of the Lord. Tremendous honor for my wife and I to be with you tonight. And um, this is the first time you have seen me uh, personally. But I have been raised in Gainesville through the preaching of uh, Pastor Arnold. Praise God. And uh, ever since I could, uh, I could remember, uh, I, I have been tremendously impacted and influenced by his ministry. And uh, really, I don't know of any body in Pentecost that have not been so. I know not any that have not been influenced by his ministry. And I'm not just saying that, uh, Pastor. If you're going to help me preach, would you stand to your feet right now? Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Grab, grab your Bible, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter number 13. 1 Corinthians 13. If I do mess up tonight, my boss is coming next week. He's going to fix it all up. Whatever I, whatever I tear up, he's, he's going to fix it. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, in verse number 12, we all know this as uh, the love chapter. Amen. Love. 1 Corinthians 13, 12. And then we're going to go next to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6. 1 Corinthians 13, 12. For now we see through a glass darkly. But then face to face, now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. Now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. And I've always heard this preach sometimes that when we see him in the rapture, when we see him in heaven, we're, we'll be able to see him face to face. But that will not be loyal to the text. The context of that chapter was talking about love. And so, 
Jesus, through the Apostle Paul, writing to the Corinthians, was writing about a special relationship with God in that we don't have to wait till heaven to see God face to face. That through a love relationship with our Lord and our Father, face to face can happen even right now. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse number 6. Ooh, well, the Holy Ghost in this place. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 6. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness had shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Everybody say glory. glory. Everybody say face. face. Bible said no man had seen God at any time and lived through it. God in its awesome purest form is unbearable and approachable light. Timothy tells us that. But when Jesus came, Jesus is the express image of his person. He is the final complete revelation of the invisible God. He has now become the effulgence of his person. And so to know Jesus and to see the face of Jesus Christ is to see the face of God. The unsearchable, unreachable, unknowing God became knowable, became reachable, and became... Because Jesus came into the picture. And the glory of God, the manifested power, the manifested glory, the weight of God can all be found in the face of our Lord Jesus Christ. In a few moments with the help of the Holy Ghost, I would like to speak on when God makes his face known. When God makes his face known. I wonder what would happen tonight if the Lord would just give us a little glimpse, just, just a little picture, just, just if he would just kind of draw back the curtains of the supernatural in this place this morning, this evening. I wonder what would happen. Amen. Hallelujah. Would you just lift up both hands in expectation and tell the Lord, Lord, I pray God that if you would give us a little glimpse of that glory, just give us a little glimpse of what your face is like. Father, hallelujah, we magnify you. Hallelujah. Jesus, 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 help me, Lord God, today to speak according to your word. Help us, O oh God, that your presence, O oh God, will have the preeminence in this place. I pray, Lord God, hallelujah, that you will lead this service, O oh God. Have your way in this place and in this house tonight. Hallelujah. Everybody say in the name of Jesus. Amen. Shake the hand of the person next to you and tell them. God bless you. You may be seated. Am I doing good yet? Thank you for three of you. Thank you. <laughs> Hallelujah. When God makes his face known, when we say the face of somebody, we don't just refer to the front of their human head. We're talking about that person's identity. In fact, when uh, a person uh, wants to hide their identity, the first thing they cover is their face. Because it denotes uh, a person's state of mind. You can see uh, their uh, emotion. You can see how they're feeling at that moment based on the look on their face. And so you can't tell yourself you're excited but you have not told your face. Because that, that, that's kind of, it, it, it doesn't jive. It's, it... And so when you, you when you... When you have something deep inside of here, your face becomes a representation of that emotion or that feeling. Praise God. That expression or that look shows up on a person's face. When you say visage, it's a uh, more formal term. 
uh, denoting a person's character. What, what makes that person tick? What, what makes that person who he really is? Praise God. And when you say face, you mean one's reputation and dignity. Hence, we have the term to save face. When you say you take something at face value, that means you take it, uh, the honesty and the purity of somebody. You take the true nature of the deal or, or, or value of that. When you say about face, you're talking about a certain direction that you need to turn toward. It's significant of your state of of your future what you want to project praise God amen when you say somebody's in your face that means that somebody is uh, defying you or opposing you uh, uh, defiantly uh, to face the future direction praise God and so when we when we hear the Bible talk about seeking the face of God the Bible means uh, uh, not seeking for a physical front of the head. Our God is all knowing and all present at all times. You, uh, you can't find a front and the back because he fills all space. And the heaven is his throne. And, 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 and his footstool is the earth. Praise God. And how big is the God that you're serving? But when we need to seek that face, I, that means uh, not just taking stuff from his hand, but looking for what makes God tick, what makes God feel God, what is his character, what, what is the direction he's looking toward, and what is the, the state of mind of God. In the day of Noah, the Bible said God repented that he created man. And so he said he was going to destroy man in the face of the earth. And, and the, the, that, that time was seven times more vile than today. And why, why, why can I say that? It's because the Bible said the thoughts and the imaginations of their heart was just evil continually. There's no moment, no minute, no second that... They weren't thinking about something evil. So it repented God. Oh, but in Genesis 6, praise God. The Bible says, but Noah found grace in the sight of the Lord. Do you know how many people there are according to scholars, people more intelligent than I am? He, they said there was about 10 to 12 billion people at the time of Noah. And 12 billion people, brother, one family, one man, found grace in the sight of God. How did Noah found grace? Noah found it because he was seeking for grace. You can't find something you're not seeking for. Noah got down to business and looked around his surroundings and looked around the world he was living in. And he said, I'm not going to raise my family in this. I'm not going to raise my family with this kind of environment. I'm going to serve God and I'm going to worship God. I'm going to be faithful to God. Noah found it because he sought for it. Hallelujah. And the Bible said, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Where did he find the enabling power to do what God wanted him to do? In the eyes of the Lord. How do you find something? You just look at where God is looking. How did he find salvation? He found it in the eyes of the Lord. If God is seeing one thing and you're seeing another thing, you've got two visions. That's division. But we need to be one with God. We need to be seeing what he sees. We need to love what he loves. We need to go where he wants us to go. So that we can have vision. One direction. Oh, 
And so when the Bible says to seek the face of God, 1 Chronicles 16, 11, seek the Lord and his strength and seek his face continually. Everybody say continually. Amen. Psalm 105, verse 4, when you seek the Lord and his strength, seek his face forevermore. Why? Seek the Lord and you shall live, the prophet Amos said. Amen. We've got a promise, hallelujah, from the word of God. Hallelujah, that God said, if you seek me, you shall find me. Hallelujah, if you seek, you shall find. If you knock on the door, it shall be open. Hallelujah, whatsoever it is. That you... God, God, Jesus said, if you ask for bread, will the Father in heaven give you a stone? In other words, he gives you exactly what you're hungry for. He gives you exactly what you're seeking for. If you're seeking for the Holy Ghost, He wants to give them the Holy Ghost. If you want blessing, He will not give you a curse. If you want healing, He will not give you sickness and disease. You get exactly what you're looking for in God. So do you think that if you're seeking for the will of the Lord, you're seeking for his face, you're seeking for his character, you're seeking what makes him happy, do you think God will hide himself from you? No, 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 no. God is going to say, I am just waiting for somebody. I'm just waiting for someone that is ready to seek after me and not after their own vision. And I'm going to be one with that person. And I'm going to walk with him. Hallelujah. That's why he says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my. Only then. Only then. Let me try the speakers on this side. If my people. Who are called by my name. If they humble me. I'm so tired of people trying to analyze all these talk shows, all these radio shows. What's wrong with America? What's wrong with our nation? How can we fix this? Come on everybody. God already detailed it in the book. If my people. Not the Republican Party. Not the Democratic Party. Not the open convention. It's not going to do it. If my people seek my face. Then will I hear from heaven. I will forgive sin and I will heal their land. You know the problem and the curse of the modern church. We seek everything else but the face of God. But all the while God is waiting, he's just, he's waiting to reveal himself. The Bible says he's waiting to show himself strong in behalf of the, whose heart is perfect toward him. Let me ask you this question. Let me ask you this question. What made the Garden of Eden paradise? If paradise was all about the garden, we in trouble. It's just a garden with trees and, and goats and, and, she, and animals and fruit. I mean, don't, don't get me wrong. It, th that garden was pretty good. It was a perfect garden. But if if that garden became a paradise just because of the fact that it was a garden, we're in trouble. What made that garden a paradise? What made that garden something to look forward to, to get back to again? It's because in that garden, God and man had a face-to-face -face relationship. God and man, hallelujah, was open to each other, was honest with each other. 
and we walked together in the cool of the day. It was about the presence of God, not the garden. I probably got that from you. I probably got it from Pastor Arnold Prisco. Hello, somebody. So we are absolutely 100% correct when we say that the Holy Ghost is a restoration of the presence of God without inhibition, without blocking. Nothing in between him and us, no veil. It's just me and God dwelling inside of my life. God restored Eden when he sent the power of the Holy Ghost. Listen, the Genesis said, and God, the Lord God, planted a garden. That's the garden of Eden. We lost out because of sin, and we got kicked out of that place, correct? Ever since, scholars were trying to find where that garden is. They couldn't find it because Eden is more than just a garden. It was a perfection of the presence of God in the midst of his people. It was the perfection of God's power and a perfection of access that we have. Now, tell me this. When Mary walked into the tomb on that fateful Sunday morning, he saw Jesus and he and she mistook him for a gardener. You know what? She did not mistake him as a gardener because at that moment after his resurrection, he was a gardener. He replanted Eden again in the hearts of you and me. Jesus showed himself strong and he said, it is finished. I have restored Eden to you. There is no hindrance. There is no blockage. You can be face to face with God one more time. The Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. I don't have time. Uh, but if... if the, he, the Hebrew word, I, I'm, I don't know enough Hebrew, but I just know enough to be dangerous. So here's the problem. <laughs> That's a problem because I know enough to be dangerous here, but not, not a lot. So, but based on that, it, the, he, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Bishop, but Hebrews are, the, the, the Hebrew language is more picture-based. It's more, it's more, uh, it's more uh, thought for thought instead of word for word. Unlike the Greek, it's very specific on each word doesn't mean another word. It's very, uh, you know, it's very constrictive that way. But the Hebrew language talks about certain words in picture format. So when the Bible says, and God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul, watch this. If you will picture that, everything else God spoke into existence. But with man, he had to pick down from the dust and he had to form man with his very hand now man already had a living form but no breath no life and so for the rendering wasn't about a blowing the bible says he breathed into his nostrils so for him to do that he should be able to have picked him up put his face Adam's face to his face and to from his nose to Adam's nose he breathed into his nostrils and so when Adam opened his eyes the very first face he saw was the face of God that's where he got his mandate that's where he got his purpose that's where he got his validation. That's where he got his meaning in life. And as long as they were looking at that face, they were in perfect communion with God. They did not need the validation of the world. They did not need, hallelujah, somebody else to tell them about what their purpose is. The face of God was their direction. The face of God told them who they are. Now, 
Now here's the quiet part. As long as they were looking, the Bible said they were both naked, but they were not ashamed. The word ashamed there comes from the word bush, which means confused. They were not in confusion. Do you think God would have allowed them to walk around in the garden with no clothes on? That's not what he was saying. Hey man, I believe the Bible tells us that he has clothed us with glory and honor. That's right. I just love it when I get to preach with Pastor Arnold. Now, we're going somewhere here. I'm, I'm trying to tell you what it is that we've lost and Jesus had to restore in our life. I'm trying to get to once I-75, Bishop. But I'm trying to get to all these little inroads here. We'll, 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 we'll zoom in with speed of light in a little bit, okay? Half of you are not convinced, praise God. And so here, here's what happened. The enemy knows that as long as they're looking at the face of God, that he, 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 there is no way that he could get them, Adam and Eve, outside of the will of God. As long as they were looking at the right face that was shining in their life, the devil couldn't get to them. So the enemy did. He, the enemy does also knew that he cannot confront God one on one. God, God whips him every time. Just, just the devil's just so stupid to, to know that he, it happens every single time and he keeps going at it. So... Lord. And so the devil did not try to get God's face away from them, but he introduced a different face. He put a different picture, a different image in between man and God to eschew the image, to eschew the picture. That's the reason why you have to be very careful whose face you're looking at. Because listen, when they were looking at the face of God, they did not see their nakedness. But the first thing they saw when they took away their eyes from the face of the master was their very own limitation, was their nakedness and their sin. And they were ashamed. First thing that happened. Because the face that you look at is what you become. If you remember, King Nebuchadnezzar, this is a Sunday night, so most of you here, you're, this is not the JV team here. You're, you're, prof, you're professionals. I mean, you, you, you know this. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, if you would remember Nebuchadnezzar, the king, and he wanted worship for himself. He did not stand in front and declare himself, worship me. What did he do? He erected an image that looks exactly like himself. 90 foot by 9, I believe. And he commanded everybody to bow down to the image as a sign of their obeisance and their worship to Nebuchadnezzar. In other words, the face is an exact representation of the thing. And when they looked at that image, they were supposed to bow. That is equal to bowing to the king. Not only is uh, the image that you look at or the face you look at is what you become. You keep on looking at a certain face, it will be the same face you reflect. That's why Moses would come down from the mountain shining from the glory of God. Why? He'd been talking to God for 40 days. Face to face. And so he had to cover himself with a veil. Just because of the glory of God that was on him. Hey, if you, if you want to be spiritual, look at spiritual things. If you want to be worldly, look at the world. But if you want to be godly, look at the face of God. When they were looking 
at the face of God, they were selfless and then they became selfish. What? The change of what they were looking at. They had a change of face. And if you're not careful, you keep on looking at the wrong face. The face you look at is the image that you pay. You will eventually serve the face you're looking at. Pharisees was trying to, was trying to uh, 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 get Jesus to say the wrong thing. And they said, look at the coin. Should we pay taxes to Caesar? Jesus said, well, whose face was in the coin? They said, well, Caesar's. Jesus said, pay to Caesar's because the, his face is on that coin. You pay him because his face is on it. Therefore, the spiritual is true. If his imprint and if God's face is implanted in our spirit and in our heart and in our heart, it will not be so hard to get you to come to church. It's not going to be hard to make you pray. It's not going to be hard to fast and worship and praise. You eventually will serve that whose face you look upon. Oh, that's why I love that song. Praise God. Hallelujah. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. Why the things of this world will grow strangely dim. It will not be so hard to teach, teach about holiness. It's about being separated unto God. Because that's implanted in your heart. It's imprinted in your heart. You're going to want to serve Jesus. You're going to want to seek what makes him glad. It's love that should be the fruit of our service. Not the other way around. Would you just raise your hand and just tell God, Lord, am I still looking at your face today? God, I need to be seeking after you and not after things, not after stuff, not after... Oh, My Lord, my Lord, my Lord. The Hebrew also says that the face of God is significant of the presence of God. I like to read a lot of medieval books and talks about kings and princesses and kingdoms. I love to see documentaries about uh, other, uh, you know, kingdoms of ancient time. And so I found out that if you are to face and you are to be in the presence of the king, you cannot, you, you've got to show the king your face. And when the king sentences somebody to the death penalty, the first thing they do is to cover that person's face. And so, the face of somebody is also their presence. In the, when you seek the face of God, His presence comes. Why is that important to you? Because in the presence of the Lord is fullness of joy. In the presence of the king, the kingdom shows up with him. I don't care what you feel about President Obama, what's your political standpoint, but if he shows up and walks down this aisle, you... Oh, I, I'm not a betting man. That's wrong. I know that's bad. Praise God, but I bet you my bottom dollar, he's going to show up with all the might of the United States of America. You got the secret service. He's going to arrive in a limo. He's going to, you know, what, what he's wearing would be, I don't know, worth, worth something, probably my whole year's salary. And everything he speaks is binding. Well, you know, it, Congress kind of challenges it, but they, it, it's been a long time since they really challenged anything. Praise God. But anyway, moving on. We don't want to lose the spirit here. Moving on. The presence of the king, if the king shows up in a place, 
He brings his kingdom with him. Isaiah 57 verse 15. The high and lofty one, he who dwells in eternity. What is eternity? Eternity is a realm completely outside ours. See, in the natural realm, we walk in time and space. And in the realm of time and space, in order to function in time and space, you've got to have weight. You have to be a matter. You have to matter. To matter in this world. Everything that occupies space and has mass is matter. Everything in the material world has weight and is a matter. And we function on a linear way. Time goes by in a linear way. You can't go back to your past. And you can't move faster than what time intended it to be. We're stuck in that realm. Eternity is not that way where God lives. God is not simply somebody who has a lot of time. He is somebody that is transcendent of time. He does not need time or space or matter to self-exist. He's Yahweh God. He's a self-sufficient and all-existing one. He does not need something to create anything. He can just pull out from nothing and it becomes something. That's why he can't lie. Whatever he says comes true. A liar is somebody that says it is, but it's not. But with God, even if it's not, if he opens his mouth, it becomes. How can you lie like that? That's why he's faithful to his word. God is not somebody that just doesn't want to lie. He cannot lie lie that's why his promises are yea and they are amen it's going to come to pass if he promises you something you can take it to the bank it's going to happen five more minutes it's been my dream to say that I made it to the big leagues now, praise God. I get to say five more minutes. Woo! Let me have an Holy Ghost. So why do I say that? Psalm chapter 22 tells us that the Lord inhabits the praises of his people. That word inhabit there means to abide, to sit, to be present. We know God is able. We know he's got all power. But the question is, will he do it? Will he show himself strong? That's what glory is. Glory is the weight of somebody. And so when God shows up with his glory, he's going to throw his weight around. He will be. Remember matter? He will be so heavy that when his glory comes down, he's going to displace everything that does not belong in his presence. It's just the nature of God. You can't occupy one space with two, with two equal amount of, of, of matter in one space. Something has to go. One of them has to go. And so if the king goes down and his presence come down in a place peace and fear cannot coexist together one of them has to leave healing and disease can't exist together one of them has to go it's not hard if you could get the face if you could get the presence of the king in your life, if he can cause you, if you can cause him to invade your space, whatever that does not belong in his presence, it's going to step out of the room. They're going to have to step out of the room. Uh, 
I'm not talking about the Philippines. I'm not talking about what happened in the book of Acts 2000, uh, 2000 years ago. I'm talking about right now, just a few weeks ago. We were just worshiping God, just, just praising the Lord. The power of God hit that place in that service. And people were lying prostrate on the floor. People were just running the aisles. And people were crying over here, laughing over here. People were receiving the Holy Ghost here. It was just a ball. We just had a great time. We're just, I was just kneeling about this part of the... Uh, I was kneeling down, just worshiping. I hope I could tell you what, what happened next was about the, the, the greatness of the anointing of the Monsignor Reverend Bishop Dave Kutar. But I had nothing to do with it, Bishop. I was, just, I was just kneeling down here, just enjoying the presence of the Lord. Suddenly, a lady from the back came running. Hand in me her hearing aids. Hearing aids. She goes, I've been wearing that thing for 17 years. My ear popped just right now. I don't need that anymore. What happened? Oh, the presence of the king came down. And diseases had to leave. The devil had to step out. And victory had to come in. And peace and joy and blessing and victory had to step into the place. If I could convince about 50 of you today. Hallelujah, whatever it is you came in here with, if you could just let the face of God to shine for five seconds in this room today, He could do more than I could do in 15 minutes. It's because when He steps into the room, His kingdom comes with Him. Everybody say face. face. Equals the presence of God. The presence of God is the face of God. In the presence of the Lord, there's fullness of joy. That's why praise and worship is important. You think it was just a couple of two-step songs here that made us feel good and caused these great people with enormous talent to just perform their talent up here? It wasn't about that at all. It's about telling God, Lord... You're being loved here. You're being praised here. We sing songs to you. We want to call your attention. Would you dwell right now? Would you sit with us? Would you abide in our midst of us? And because God dwells in a realm that is completely outside of our time, He can't be beholden by what beholds us in this present realm. Let me give you an example. When God talked to Moses in the burning bush, God came down in that bush. And the Bible said the bush was on fire. But Moses turned aside because it was such an awesome sight. A bush that's burning but's not consumed. God came down in the bush. God is a consuming fire. But because when God came down to that bush, eternity came with him. And so time was not. And my science teacher told me, for anything to burn, it needs time to burn. For example, a little piece of leaf, you put that under the sun, under the uh, magnifying lens, it will, it, will, it will burn and be totally consumed to ashes in eight seconds flat. That's just the time it needs for it to burn. But when God came down to that bush, the God who lived in eternity that's outside of the realm of time. He was not beholden to it. And so that fire was burning, but it was not consumed. Case study, case study. In, in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Another example in the Bible. I'm not making this up, Bishop. The three Hebrew children. Three Hebrew boys. Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. I never want to use their Babylonian names. I never want to use it. It's Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was a name given to them in Babylon to change their identity. And so they go, well, king, nope, we ain't bowing. Sorry. Our God is able to deliver us. But if not, we're still going to worship him. We're still going to praise him. In other words, 
there's just no other face worth looking into. Death is better than look at any other face. I want to look at the face of God and when I look at the alternative, death is sweeter than whatever's out there. And so they threw the three Hebrew boys into the fiery furnace. That furnace was so hot that the people that threw them there died first. Oh, but then the king kind of looked and there's kind of, didn't we throw three there? There's a fourth man, the figure of a son of man. And behold, I see four men walking. They were loose in there. In fact, it was so good that when they get out of that fire, even the smell of smoke was, wasn't even in their clothing. How is that relevant? The God that is a consuming fire that's not beholden by time stepped with them into the fire and so they were burned but they were not consumed because eternity came down with God. So whatever fire you are in the middle of today, you will not be consumed. You will not be burned. It will not kill you. You will not die. You, it's not the end of you. As long as you could get the fourth man in the fire. If you can get the presence of Jesus in the fire, he will deliver you. He will set you free. And whatever it is that in the middle of fire that you're going through, it will not consume you. So here it is. Let's put it in practical terms. Is it deer season yet? Is it deer season? No. You don't? Do, okay. Anyway. Let's say you're hunting. Who likes hunting? Okay. But my brother here. You, you say you're hunting. And you were up in the tree and you were, what's that call where you sit on it and you wait, the tree stand. And you were waiting for a deer to come by and suddenly uh, a raccoon stepped over and kind of startled you. And you dropped from the, from the tree 20 feet. And you broke your elbow, you broke your arm. Well, you go to the orthopedic surgeon. You go to the doctor. The doctor said, well, it will take 18 weeks for the bone to heal. In other words, you will get healed, you just need time to heal. But in the service like this, and when the face of God can shine, and the presence of God can shine, God can come down in a place, go 18 weeks to your future, pick up that healing from the future, go back to your present right now, and heals you right now. We call it a miracle. All it was, was the presence of the God who dwell in eternity. His face just shone in the house. He caused his face to just shine in the house. Stuff that stuff that somebody said to you what your mama did what your papa did what your ex-husband said and what your children left you and things that happened to you in the past uh, and that still causes you shame and trouble and guilt uh, and fear and anxiety and depression and suicidal thoughts uh, in a service like this god can come back 30 years to your past uh, and obliterate and erase uh, every single thing that still causes you pain every single thing that still causes you hurt every single thing that still causes you trouble and God will heal you right here, right now. If you could get God to shine in his face in this room today, whatever it is you came in here with, you can walk out of this place delivered. You can walk out of this place healed. You can walk out of this place with an answer to your prayer. All because of God whose face shone in the house.
Lift both hands to heaven. What's bothering you tonight? What are the things that are coming against you? The enemy only wants to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But God said, I have come to give you life. And give you life more abundantly. I wonder tonight, for a few more minutes here today, before we're dismissed, would somebody let the presence of Almighty God shine down upon this place and let His face shine into your life and when you look up at that face whatever bothers you right now would have to leave in the presence of the King You're asking your